welcome to How to Make Everything Go Viral. Uh, or, you know, let's see if I can make this work. Uh, just kidding, because you can't. Uh, Laura is going to do the first section of this, and then I will take the second half of this, and we'll go from there. Uh, and we'll start from there. Okay, so um, uh, so many windows. Okay, so uh, we're going to introduce ourselves in a little bit, uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, Facebook social sharing practices, how to tell a good story, and uh, some uh, questions at the end. Uh, so you can put questions in the chat, but we probably won't get to them until the end. So I guess, Adam, I just say next slide or I telepathically think to you next slide and then you, yep. yes. Uh, we talk fast. Uh, well, Adam talks fast. I'll let him, I think I talk at a normal speed. Uh, but again, there will be uh, slides, summary slides at the end. And I think also we could probably get you the slides or it may be up on the app afterwards. Uh, I think last yeah. time it was so it might take a couple days, but we'll get them all there. Yeah. Yes. So you, you, so it's a free country. You can take notes if you want, but you don't have to. Uh, what makes me a fancy expert? Uh, I have uh, been around the block a few times. Um, when uh, Trump uh, blocked me on Twitter, I was an international story. And when former Senator Heller threw me out of his uh, uh, town hall. I was an international story again. Uh, and I am a digital consultant and I work with uh, campaigns and nonprofits to uh, help spread their good stuff. Uh, um, what makes me an expert? I helped cause the Dean scream. I was Upworthy's uh, highest performing uh, writer and our lowest. And I made Facebook worse by in innovating a lot of really bad clickbait headlines. Uh, I was the creative director on a Facebook political ad campaign in 2018 that did not help at all, but it learned a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm taking a break during the pandemic to write a novel uh, after the uh, coup. It made me change uh, my angle a little. So I'm writing about how a, a girl is going to defeat Facebook and aliens. So that's going to be fun. And I think Facebook should be broken up and sold for parts like this amazing senator. So I'm a fan of her. Uh, and that's why I'm an expert. So do we have to use Facebook? Uh, I mean, nobody has to do anything. We live in an arguably free country. But if you want the largest audience, 69% of US adults use Facebook while Facebook is up. When Facebook is down, 0% <laughs> of US adults use Facebook. 74% uh, of those users visit at least once per day. So if Facebook is a useful tool because you can not only uh, reach the people that uh, like your page, but also you can reach audiences beyond that uh, through friends of friends. And when people interact with your content, then the people they're in relationship with will see it. So it can be a good way to share news. And if you do it strategically, it won't be a time suck, um, but you have to set limits with yourself because it's easy to fall down the Facebook hole and then wake up hours later and having done nothing. Uh, there are a bunch of other social media tools, some of which we'll talk about today. Uh, Facebook is the best for mass audiences because like we, we mentioned before, um, most US adults use it. The numbers for uh, Twitter and other platforms are small smaller. So you can use other platforms to strategically uh, reach uh, specific groups of people, but Twitter is not a mass medium in the way that Facebook is or in the way that YouTube is. Uh, and if you have limited time and resources, which most of us do, uh, it, it may, it's better to do one or two platforms well than having an account on a whole bunch of different places that is basically dead, that hasn't had any new content in years. Like that looks really bad. It's better not to engage if you uh, can't do it right. And the way that the uh, Facebook algorithm works uh, can be tricky because uh, 
one thing you could do is watch the uh, Facebook whistleblower on uh, 2020 and uh, at, in front of Congress explaining the Facebook algorithm. But the thing is, there is so much content that Facebook could show to any one person at any time uh, that Facebook has to make choices. And so what Facebook shows to people when it has, you know, like a hundred different pieces of thing, it, 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 pieces of content at any minute, the stuff that's going to show to people um, is, as the whistleblower said, the stuff that's going to make people angry and pissed off and furious and engage. Because at the end of the day, Facebook is a money making machine and how they make money is having people's eyeballs stapled to Facebook all day. So it's always going to be in Facebook's best interest to do the things that make you addicted and uh, posting uh, thoughtful, educational, heartwarming stuff is often not the thing that will get you to stay on Facebook as much as if somebody is wrong on the internet and you need to tell them why they are wrong. Uh, and people don't usually go to your page to get your news. You know, they get their news from the news feed. So again, you are competing against all the other organizations and their friends and their friends' babies and their friends' babies' cats and their friends' babies' cats' babies uh, to be shown to any one person at any time. Uh, and whether people see your stuff now or in the future depends on how they have reacted to your stuff in the past. And so if you do things that don't cause a lot of engagement, like if you post boring press releases that people don't like, they don't share, they don't comment on, Facebook algor algorithm learns and will show your stuff to less people in the future. So being bad at Facebook is actually going to make it so that you do worse in the future. Oh, and video metrics can be deceiving. So <laughs> and there's already been a whole scandal about how uh, Facebook falsified some of their video metrics. And so there was the whole pivot to video and all these news platforms laid off all their journalists. And it turns out that there was a fraud. Moving on. But the thing is, with, with all of Facebook metrics, take it with a grain of salt. So how can you grow your audience? Uh, because Facebook's algorithm, you know, operates on engagement, you should post stuff that people are going to want to engage with. So whether it's they want to uh, give a thumbs up or they want to hate it, uh, that's you, you want people to feel things when they see their stu your stuff. Uh, and you also want to be regular about it uh, because uh, Facebook's algorithm pays attention to that. So if you only post something like every few months, Facebook doesn't have enough information to go off of and they're less likely to prioritize your stuff in the future. So you do not have to be in front of a computer all day long, every day scheduling. You can do it in bulk, but you do want to aim for regular content on Facebook in particular. And if you have trouble finding all the content, uh, you can use other people's stuff. People do that all the time. Share other people's content that you know, your audience is going to care about. And you can make yourself uh, a destination for when people want to know uh, what to do about a thing or uh, news updates. So, you know, if, if you are a pro-choice organization, I imagine you got a lot of traffic after the Texas um uh, the, the Texas law was signed, you know, people looking for that reputable source and to find out what's going on. And so you can do that with, with your page. Uh, also, it's important to, t to post a variety of content because Facebook optimizes to the individual user. So that means if somebody likes, uh, Ted Lasso uh, animated GIFs, Facebook is going to show them more Ted Lasso animated GIFs. And so if somebody likes videos, Facebook will show them more videos if they like news stories, et cetera, et cetera. So if you are only posting one type of content, you are only going to reach one type of audience. So that's why it's important to vary up the stuff that you post. And as I said before, don't post boring stuff because not only is it going to sink, but uh, Facebook is going to hold that against you in the future. Uh, 
be authentic uh, because uh, people are choosing to engage with your page, to follow your page. They can unfollow you at any time. So you are competing against the whole rest of the folks on Facebook. And if you are not compelling and or interesting, people will stop seeing, you will stop engaging with your stuff and Facebook will eventually stop showing it to them. Uh, talk like a human, be voicey. Uh, you know, this goes back to don't be boring because it it's like a TV channel and people can change the channel on you. Yep. Uh, empower them. Uh, interact with your followers because this, this again is telling uh, Facebook's algorithm likes it. So if people are commenting on your page, you know, reply, like their comments, engage with that, and then it, it'll show up more in their feeds and their friends' feeds and so on. It, it, it will boost your, your content. Uh, you can also work together with other organizations. So if you are launching a big video, you can use Facebook cross-posting behind the scenes to let other pages more easily share it. Also, you can uh, organize your allies in, on various di uh, different social media platforms. So like I'm in various email groups, I'm in Facebook private groups, I'm in DM groups on Twitter where people are constantly sharing their stuff. You know, people create social media toolkits and then they send it out to people and say, hey, share. Uh, and you can also uh, use tools like uh, Speechify, which is a newer one that lets you assemble your social media toolkit in a way that uh, makes it easy for end users to share your content. Uh, social scheduling tools uh, will often tell you when the best time is to post on any given platform to reach the largest audience. You can also find that information yourself via Facebook Insights, which is free to look at. Uh, it is harder on other platforms to find the best time. If you have an Instagram business page, you can see the best time to post on Instagram. But like Twitter, I don't think that there are any free tools that will tell you the best time to tweet to reach your audience. Uh, and you know, don't share bad stuff. Facebook will penalize you especially. I don't think that Twitter uh, pays attention to past performance in the same way. But uh, in all these algorithms, you want you want to be sharing good stuff, people engage, the algorithm likes you, that your future stuff will be shared more. Um, this slide I kind of have a passion for, so I thought I'd do this one. Uh, Facebook will consistently be changing the rules on you no matter what happens. When I was Upworthy, uh, we were, you know, blowing everything away and then slowly uh, they were cut off at the knees and time and time again we found that they continue to do things that end up making things worse for society whether it's Russian Facebook ads or data print Cambridge Analytica or you know when they just they tried to make their platform here and it got angrier instead they usually don't realize the impact they're making well now we realize they do thanks to the whistleblower um, they, you know, they found that their was contributing to eating disorders. They found that they were helping with the capital riot by allowing them on their platform. They, they did a lot. And Zuckerberg's at the top of that. So you can never trust what's going to do. So take everything with a grain of salt. And remember, the rules will constantly change uh, because that is the way Facebook ends up doing things at the end of the day. And all of these platforms, keep in mind, they are for-profit businesses. They will change the rules on you if it benefits them. So like in the back of your mind, be thinking about if you're putting a lot of money in to any of these platforms that the rules could change. And what you want to be doing is building something like your email list that your organization owns forever and you will always have the ability to reach back out to people. So if you collect mobile numbers, if you collect emails, you could you always have that way of directly connecting to your supporters as opposed to mediated through a for-profit company. Beware. Um, so anyone who tells you they can make anything go viral is not telling you the truth. They're either naive or lying. Um, almost nothing will go viral. It, there's, there are no true tricks to really make it happen. Um, there are a lot of things you can do to help yourself along the way to give you a, more success than you would expect, but virality is like a next level thing that's very rare now. It's, it's almost impossible. So you should focus on what you can accomplish. And that 
is telling a good story well to the right audience. So we should give this deck a more realistic title than How to Go Viral. This is really called How to Help Complex Ideas that Inform People Reach a Larger Audience by Creating, Sharing, Shorter, Engaging, Bite-Sized Stories that are Optimized for Facebook, TikTok, or whatever. I know that's a title, long title. They wouldn't let us use that. Um, and so to do that, there's a lot of things you can uh, do. And story strategy and data can help you go really far. You have to think about uh, the story and the audience. And in the story, you need to have a great character. You need to have emotion. You need to have surprise. I can't tell you how important surprise is in these videos to keeping people around and watching the whole thing, especially on Facebook. Um, you have to have a good structure, a beginning, a middle, and the end. And then you have to give them meaning. Um, and then for the audience, you have to have all that data. You need to know who your audience is. You need to know the medium that they're looking at your stuff on. Uh, you need to know how you're going to frame it to make them do what you want them to do. You need to know what action you want them to take. And you need to know what their habits are so that you can get them to come back and keep seeing that content regularly. And surprising facts are one of the most powerful tools in your arsenal. Um, facts don't change people's mind alone. But when you have them and use them right, they can do great things. With great facts come great responsibility. You have to do more than just give them people facts because they they have a billion different pieces of content to look at on the internet. And there's no reason for them to stay or just getting that part of it from you because they won't retain it very well unless there's more to it. Uh, facts alone can change people's minds sometimes. It depends on the type of fact you're talking about. Um, there's this uh, uh, podcast by David McRaney called You Are Now Less Dumb, You Are Not So Smart. And in it, he talks about uh, how to get people to move to your side. Um, so, so, for example, I'm going to give you some facts that I can change your mind about right now. Did you think, do you think Napoleon was four foot eight, five foot two, or five foot seven? Um, in fact, he was not as short as everyone thought. He was not four foot eight. And in fact, he was not five foot two. He was actually five foot seven. He was five foot two in French units from that time period, but in modern units, he was actually five foot seven and a little taller than average for most French people at the time. He always just had huge uh, soldiers standing behind him, so people thought he was shorter than he was. Blind as a bat is another one. Bats are not blind. They actually have amazing view, uh, vision. Uh, they just use echolocation on top of it, and it's not really a thing. That's a fact. The 1913 assembly line, Ford inventing the assembly line, he didn't actually do that. One of his buddies went to a, butcher, uh, a, a butchery and saw the, how they were doing the meat, and so they thought they could apply that to cars, but in actuality, it wasn't just about meat. It actually was, goes back all the way to um, Italy and the Venetian arsenal where they were building uh, boats on assembly lines back in 1100. So those facts don't do anything to you. They're fine, you can accept those because they're real and they don't do anything. And the reason you don't panic about that is because they, these facts don't define you or your culture or who you are. Um, but what if the facts you have change people's could change people's worldview if they're things that are personal to them and intense, but that they feel passionate about? Um, with those kinds of facts, some people panic. They did this MRI experiment and they found that the response in someone's brain when they hear something that challenges their worldview uh, gave the same kind of reaction in their brain as the panic when they would see a bear chasing them. Um, it makes them really panic about everything. And you're probably wondering, well, why is that? happening and it's called the backfire effect. Essentially, when your core beliefs are challenged, your brain has a choice. You know, I could say climate change is real and most people just go, you know, I don't believe you, you're biased, everything I've known because the, uh, the alternative choice is that their parents, their siblings, their friends, their grandparents, their teachers, everyone lied to them about that and everything else they've ever known. And because of that, they, have, they usually go with A and that's why getting through to these people is much harder. So what can you do in that situation when you're trying to get people to, to see your worldview and accept things that are not uh, kosher with the reality they've known and reinforce empathy and trust with empathetic storytelling? So empathetic storytelling, these are the same things I had mentioned before. You have to have great characters. You have to have an emotional connection to it. Those human stories are gonna be important. You have to surprise people again um, and you have to make it relatable, you have to have a structure, and you have to give them meaning that will make them feel okay with it. Um, and again, the weeds, you have to make sure you know the audience you're talking to, why you're talking to them, what the medium is, how you're going to frame it to them, and the actions and the habits that they have. 
So when you're defining your audience, you really have to ask, who am I trying to reach? Are you trying to reach your base? Are you trying to reach your base plus your their family members? Are you trying to reach all the way outside uh, to people all across the country and not just your people? You know, it's easy for me to, it, got, it was very easy for me to get my mom to like my page. She did it easily. It was harder to get my mom to start sharing things. Um, it's even harder to get my mom's friends to click on things. It's even harder to get my mom's friends to share the things that I share. It's even harder to get their, my mom's friends' friends to share things. And then getting Kevin Bacon to share is the hardest. So you have to really think about how deep you want it to go if you really want to get that full range of virality. Um, and there are signs, there are data signs behind virality that you can sort of look at. So like the very simplistic version of this um, uh, are, you know, if you get if you post something on Facebook and it doesn't get any shares or any clicks, nobody's interested in it. Um, if you get something that has tons of shares and no clicks, that means you didn't package it well. The headline, the image, we're not inviting people to click on it, and so they didn't. So it does have potential because people are actually sharing it. If you have no shares and tons of clicks, that means you have clickbait, and that is bad and never do it, and I learned my lesson a long time ago. And if you get tons of shares and tons of clicks, that means you could win because you have packaged it well and people are going to love it. So more importantly, to get shares, your content has to live up to the framing that you put on Facebook. It can't be deceiving. Uh, and just to step in for a second, uh, somebody asked, yeah. are these panels recorded for later viewing? And yes, I believe, yes, you can watch everything later. So if you've yeah. missed anything or if you think we're brilliant, you can watch us again and again until we're a little frightened. That's right. Um, so an example of smart framing. When I, long time ago, back at the beginnings of all of this stuff, uh, I had written an article about uh, income inequality between monkeys. There was a science experiment where a monkey was handed a, a, a rock. They had to take it to the other side of the cage, give it to the scientist, and the scientist would give them a, a piece of cucumber. And they kept going around and giving around. And then the, sec and the third time they did it, they gave one monkey a grape and the other one the cucumber. The one with the cucumber saw the grape, was furious, threw it back, threw the cucumber back at the scientist, and it was like income inequality. So the message was that. I decided to be clever, uh, and my boss wrote up the same article, not realizing I was writing it up too. I put, remember Planet of the Apes, it's closer to reality than you think. It doesn't tell you what it's about. It's very vague, and it's a pop culture reference that a lot of people don't get. Uh, she made it very clear. Two monkeys were paid unequally, unequally, see what happens next. We don't use those headlines anymore again. But she had 7 million page views, and I had 10,000 page, page views on the same article. Now, again, Facebook's changed the algorithm a billion times since then. Most of that isn't relevant other than making sure that you have your audience knows what they're clicking into. Uh, but don't use clickbait because it is evil and bad. Uh, so it has to pay off. Once they get through to that piece, it really needs to tell the story well. Um, and there's also data behind that video virality. There's uh, Facebook has these metrics that are not great, but they have what are called three-second views, 10-second views, and actual completion. Um, three-second views means if you scrolled by it on your phone and you just happened to pass by and it took you three seconds to scroll, it counts as a view even though you weren't looking at it. 10-second um, views means like you actually stopped and slowed down to look at it, and then completion views is if you really got it. So if you're just getting none of those views, it means your, con your video was not good. If you get the three-second views but not the rest, it means you made the opening good enough for them that they saw it, and, and then they skipped it because they weren't interested. If you get them past the 10-second views, you might do it. And if you get them a lot of people complete your video, that means you're doing it right, and you should keep copying that model of what you're doing. Um, and so you better have some great facts to share and you better open well, presuming Facebook hasn't juked the stats and lied to you, which they did, uh, so that's fine. Um, and there's also data behind engagement. Comments and shares and engagements all can help impact the increase of your, you know, the impact of your, of your content. So again, it's the same kind of pattern. You know, if you're getting lots of comment and engagement and no shares, it means you've made something that makes people yell at each other, but doesn't make them want to share it. If you make something that gets tons of comments, shares, and engagement, all of it, that's a good sign, and it's something that you should be pushing out to more people, giving a little ad budget, budget to. So to get engagement, it's good to focus on framing the Facebook packaging, and more importantly, you have to tell a compelling story. So there's, there is this um, video uh, a long time ago that I covered about climate change that did really well, and it was about local municipal power in Boulder. And it sounded like the most boring thing ever when I heard about it, but then I watched it, it was really good. And so I tested it a ton and found there were like 14 different things that impacted its success. And I got 4 million views on local municipal power ballot issues. 
Um, and so it sort of built theories for me about what can be successful and how successful it can be. And so here are those 14 things I've seen work well in successful social videos. So Adam, would you say this is 14 things that will shock you? They will not shock you. And if you are able to include all 14 things, uh, you will have won the internet. But again, it's hard to do all of these at once. And uh, I know you're trolling me and that's rude, but we're gonna have time at the end because I talked fast. So it's gonna be okay to answer questions. Um, so here's the thing. So first thing is relatable characters. You need a hero, a villain, like you need, characters that people can connect to personally and relate to. Um, there's uh, Pixar has these 22 rules for characters. Um, you should check them out. Uh, it sort of walks you through all of the things they do when making movies and telling those stories. It's a great little intro to that sort of thing. Second thing is a strategic story structure. There are no original stories. Like everything has been copied and copied and copied from the beginning of time over and over again. Um, and there's different story arcs that you can follow. On social media, you know, it's it's a little simpler because you need to know, you know, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, and how we're going to get there and how we win. Um, but, you know, there's a billion different ways you can do story arcs, and it's just a matter um, of how you do that. Uh, the third thing is, and this is the most important thing on every single platform, I really think, is hook them immediately. Um, in When uh, This American Life starts, whenever you listen to one of their podcasts, they don't talk about, hi, this is This American Life, and we're a radio show and all of this stuff. They open with in the middle of a story. They say, Bob was wrestling an alligator, and he didn't know what he was going to do about it. How is he going to get out of this? They start in the middle so that you're hooked right away. So that's the same thing for these videos. It means you know, making sure uh, you use those first three seconds that people are scrolling by to really notice stuff. So you have to use those three seconds wisely. Um, this is a video about Laura's um, you know, uh, fight uh, for healthcare and with her, the cancer that she had. Which um, we would show if videos worked, but we, we discovered last year they don't. So yeah. to, uh, to give you a sense of how I open with my story in public speaking or in op-eds or whatever, uh, I always try to get somebody's attention and hold it. Uh, and so I usually start my story with, uh, I walked into a doctor four years ago, I walked into a doctor's office with a nagging cough and I walked out with a stage four cancer diagnosis. So I immediately have hooked people. They want to know what happened next. They're a little bit shocked They're, you know, but I, I look healthy. So they know there's going to be a happy ending. So, you know, I, I try to get right to the point and grab people's attention and then never let it go like a roller coaster. Exactly. And you have to make sure that it's attention grabbing, even with the sound off. They have to be able to read it and they have to be able to see it because most of them don't have their sound on before they uh, scroll by and you're auto playing. So there needs to be text on screen, especially on Facebook. On TikTok, it's a little bit different, but uh, I'm not an expert on that one. Um, and so make sure this, even with the sound off, someone could watch the entire video and understand what was going on. Uh, don't waste time with cinematic credits on a social platform. You don't need intros and titles and credit, you know, all these things. You have you have so much, so little time to really make it clear what you're trying to do and accomplish. Uh, spell everything out in the eye-catching and very readable font. It can't be, you know, uh, uh, what's the sans, you know, the sans script or any of that. It needs to be like bold serif fonts or uh, sans serif fonts that are easy to read for people. How um, dare you insult my comic sans? <laughs> uh, and look at your video metrics to see where people are dropping off. All of these platforms can show you little times where people like decided they wanted to stop watching it. If you look in Facebook analytics, YouTube analytics, it shows you where people drop off. So you can see when your story is like either pissing people off or boring them and you can figure out what to do next. Uh, another thing my mentor used to work at This American Life and what they would do after they finished an episode is they'd all get in a room, listen to it, and then mark down the parts where they got bored. And then if there was consistency about that amongst themselves, they would cut the parts that didn't that were that were losing people's attention. So it's like little things like that can make all the difference in whether a video does great or doesn't. Uh, number four, surprise them repeatedly. Uh, you know, this amazing thing, this many people, you know, this many, this science, you know, whatever the science fact is, they people actually do like science and hearing about it. And if there are some mind blowing stats that actually do shock people, use them and use them very 
very clearly and cleanly so people can understand them. Um, keep it simple. Uh, there's the this thing called the overkill backfire effect. Uh, the, the the debunker's handbook uh, talks about it. But essentially, if you overwhelm people with 37 things, they're not going to retain any of that. If you give them three things, it's easy for them to easier for them to grasp onto it, and they'll be more primed to come read the next thing. Um, and so you should really focus on keeping it simple and not doing anything to overwhelm them. And and to that end, you need to meet people where they live. If you're you need to know who your audience is and then talk to them at a level they can understand and their friends and family can understand. Uh, you can't be teaching 401 level ideas to you know one-on-one -on -one students. You got to ask what the average person knows about this. You're deeply entrenched in this stuff and you're passionate about this stuff and you know all kinds of stuff about it. Um, the people who are watching this for the first time or just hearing it, they are not as keen or aware about the language or any of it. So they need you to be a little gentler with them. Figure starting point is and frame it from that angle. Um, and these were just sort of like some random articles, you know, when we were back in the day, like things that we would use to like help connect people to these issues. Um, you know, and you you need to be very human with them and you need to keep it again at their at, at their level. Being authentic, as Laura mentioned previously, is so key. Some of my some of my biggest successes back in the day were ones where it was just raw camera footage of someone just being emotional on screen. Uh, there was this ice bucket challenge way back when and the person who wrote it up for Upworthy had there, this guy does this whole car wash, but he's in a bikini thing, gimmick comic thing at the beginning. And our writer started it from when he started talking about finding out he had ALS. He skipped that and just went straight to the part where this guy talked about his AL, how his mom has ALS and how he found out he just had ALS. And it increased its performance by a, a ton. Um, and it, ended up getting him like a ton of money for fundraising. It helped, they, Ellen paid for his wedding um, and they, they raised 3.5 million from this campaign alone for the Ice Bucket Challenge. Personalize the issue. The closer it is to your experience, the more likely you're to take the message in deeply. Um, there was this study they did around hand towels. I know this is weird, um, but essentially they decided to do uh, signage experiments in a hotel. So they put up a sign saying, hang up your towels, it'll be good for the environment. It barely made a dent. People increased hanging up their towels just a little bit. For another group, they said the majority of the guests in this hotel also hung up their towels. That increased participation 26%. Just people knowing that the pressure of other people were doing it in the same hotel made more people want to do it. And then for the last group, they put the majority of the guests in this hotel, in this hotel room, hung up their towels, and that increased participation another 33%. When people think it's in their backyard, they're more likely to be able excuse me, be able to grasp it and conceive of it. A lot of climate change content often would be like, the entire world is gonna die if you don't do something about it. But if you give somebody, give people something smaller, like if you do this small thing, you can impact your community, they're more likely to feel like they are empowered to do something about it. Another thing is seeding optimism and offering solutions. You can tell them about a problem, but if you just leave them there without anything to do about it, then people, uh, can't pick it or they don't, you know, they don't react to it as well. Um, the lunch counter process started with four, four guys, you know, they were in their dorm room and they were like, let's do this. And they peer pressured each other and said, one guy said, are you guys chicken? And they all went into the coffee shop the next day and they all sat together and other people saw them do that and they got inspired. So knowing that their community participates make, makes people more likely to take action if they know someone in their backyard is doing it. And so you should, Reinforce that by explaining that it's worked before. Showing results of other places it's happened, other places that it's worked is really great and shows that people can know it's something they can pull off. Um, now, this is another thing that's grown contentious lately, especially in light of Facebook's actions. But early on, we found that positive action-oriented stories will see the best sharing results. Um, you know, if you are feeling like you are, um, you know, being angry is one thing, and but feeling empowered and doing something with that anger is enough to make people want to share it. So you need to give them hope enough and give them uh, any, anything you can to make them feel like that watching this, someone else will feel determined to want to take action as well, rather than just give all up, all hope. But I don't think that this is necessarily true anymore. Like right now, That's I personally right. see the best sharing results on Facebook with stories about uh, Republicans that uh, were anti-vax and then got COVID and died. 
those share like gangbusters. <laughs> yeah, so. and that's and again, like rage will get tons of engagement, which Facebook is rewarding now. Like I, I believe it was in Europe, candidates were writing to Facebook saying, "You need to change your policies and and algorithm because now we're being forced to post things that make people angry and hate each other." Uh, to keep our interaction rates up. So could you change it? And then Facebook was like, no, we're good. And so sh sharing for hope will give is a good uh, palate cleanser for the rage and the like, haha, we got them kind of thing. But beyond the base people, when you're trying to reach the widest audience, you'll want to make it so that they feel empowered to do it. Translate data into human speak. Large numbers can overwhelm people. So there was this video about called The Rainforest Needs You, You're a Good Person. And in it, they talked about first 32 million acres a year. Nobody can grasp 32 million. But what they can uh, grasp is uh, a football field worth of forest is going away every 72 seconds. And it's a smaller number, shrink the data so that they can understand the concept in a way that will make them really grasp it. Let people think for themselves. You, you, the truth is on our side. Uh, you don't have to beat them over the head with it. Um, don't turn your villain into a cartoon monster in real life. You know, uh, you should sh uh, shrill partisanship will make it harder to share beyond your base um, and give people the facts if your goal is to reach the widest audience. If your goal is to reach your base and get them fired up, you don't need to worry about that. You can do all the partisanship you want. But if, you're, if you want to go beyond them, you want to make sure it isn't so like banging them over the head that they can't, don't feel, their friends don't feel comfortable sharing it after seeing it. Uh, and on that same line, there was a video that I, uh, we don't have time for, but uh, there was this video a long time ago from 350.org where they made fun of all politicians uh, who were against climate change. Back then, Democrats were also against climate change. So they didn't name it specifically Republican versus Democrat. They just said, let's name hurricanes after the um, politicians who deny that climate change is real. It's a hilarious video. You should watch it. The link's in there, but I'll send it around in the deck later. Um, mm -hmm. Then the next thing is address concerns head on and gently. Um, if there are counter arguments to whatever you're doing, if you know that they're going to come for you with that, make sure you already get in your video from your point of view, in your frame, so that they don't have that to stand on when they watch the video. Um, it will help disarm people and make them more likely uh, to share because you want to give them no excuse not to share. Uh, there's another thing around the debunker's handbook and all of this. Um, when you do address something, you need to fill it in with a new fact. If you tell them something isn't true, you, that's not enough because they'll immediately just presume it is true again because they don't have anything to balance that out. Uh, the the McRaney sort of gives an example of uh, thinking of people's brains as a table. If you're going to take away a table leg from their entire worldview, you need to put a new table leg in that allows them to be able to sit at that table. So when you debunk something, give them the answer as to what the truth is as well. If you don't, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll fall back on their old habits and believe the original thing. Uh, second to last thing, make an easy ask. Don't make them do everything at once. Um, usually like liking sharing is like the main thing you want to do if you're trying to get them to come back for more and more and more. You can very rarely ask for a donation. If you have a good reason to ask for a donation, that's very specific. Um, but put them, you know, pull them in with small things and they might come back later repeatedly after they've gotten used to your page, seeing how, and they've engaged with it consistently over time. And then the last thing is leave them in a good place. Uh, you cannot leave them feeling powerless and small. It doesn't have to be a happy ending. Like the Tiananmen Square guy is sort of a, a very clear example of this, you know. He is this this signal of hope in in an overwhelming powerless situation. He inspired a billion people. You don't have to only say happy things. You don't have to keep people jolly all the time. You just have to give them somewhere to go with their emotions that makes them feel empowered to do the next thing. So I just broke a bunch of my rules as I was talking about all this stuff. Um, so I'll simplify it in this. You can screenshot this next slide, but the deck will it'll be coming with the deck as well. Um, but here's those 14 rules again. Relatable characters, a story arc, hook them immediately, surprise them, keep it simple, meet people where they live, be authentic, personalize it, offer solutions, make data relatable, let people think for themselves, address concerns in your frame, make small asks, and leave them in a good place. If you are able to do all of these things in one video, you are a superhero, I will be very, but even if you just do a couple of them in one video, you're gonna have more success than you would if you just, you know, 
just went to the normal thing that you've been doing over time. Let's make this simpler for when you're just making video content or you're writing team. I managed a writing team in 2018 and I always asked my writers to like fill out these questions before every time they made a video before they stood it. And they are as follows. Who are you trying to reach and why? You gotta know who you're talking to and why you're talking to them and what your goal is at the end. What are the most surprising facts that will open people's eyes? What are the things that will make people stick around? Um, and once you have the answer to those things, you can then, this is how you can hook them in the first three seconds. You can say, okay, this thing will start with this surprising fact, then 30 seconds later, we'll bust out the next second one to keep them hooked. Then the third one, you sort of break them all out so that people are there for the entire thing. And that could, you know, that's not apl applicable to every story. Some of them are just human stories of people talking um, about their life story. But like when you can make sure that first three seconds is clutch. Um, are there any real life human stories? Like I said, the human element makes people feel empathy. And then they're more open and warm, warm and open to, to accepting the facts you are giving them. Um, and what emotion do you want to leave them with? Again, do you want to empower them? Uh, do you want to take action? All that stuff. And, and, and the action you want them to take. So you want to give them an emotion to leave with and then the action that they are going to take. Um, so that's, that's it for that. Um, there's one other thing. There's a bunch of other sessions around storytelling and dealing with the Facebook algorithm that you should check out this, uh, this week. There's the how to TikTok. TikTok is growing fast. If your target audience is younger folks, you should definitely go to that. I'm going to go to that so I can learn. Um, and then there's all these other panels as well. You should uh, check all of them out because they're all going to help you figure out how to solve these problems and try to reach your audience more. Um, and then lastly, here is a Brazilian porcupine eating a sweet potato. Uh, and we will start answering your questions. Yes. Uh, and I have been collecting up people's questions, uh, but the most common question is, uh, are people going to get the slides? And I believe we can upload them as a PDF into the app. I think that's what we did last time around. Um, uh, Alana might be able to answer that in chat, whether we can do that. If we can't, I would strongly suggest that you follow Adam and I on social media, and we'll probably put out a link that way. Um, the and... final deck will be, pr probably won't be ready till next week, but I'll get it to everybody with notes and everything. We'll figure out a way to get it to you. Yes. So going back to the uh, earliest question, uh, Melissa wanted to know, are hashtags useful for Facebook? And my opinion on that is a little bit because you can do searching um, uh, for via, fa you can do searching via hashtags on Facebook, but it doesn't seem to be uh, super useful, not like uh, Instagram or Twitter. Adam, I feel like you're I feel like Facebook has said it really does help, but I don't believe them. <laughs> so, um, but uh, look at what their latest policy update is on it. I haven't been using hashtags in a while, but I assume some people are, and there's probably some effect for depending on what, what uh, audience it is. And Nikki wants to know, how does the algorithm affect content shared in groups? Is group content prioritized in any way? And yes, I believe that the latest version of the Facebook algorithm does prioritize groups. So you can see a lot of uh, organizations with pages have also created groups to uh, ship out more of their content. And that's one of the issues. Um, with disinformation, with this anti-vax stuff, and with the whole, you know, attacking our democracy stuff, like there are all these groups in Facebook uh, prioritizes their content and prioritizes um, the groups themselves. Like if you join some groups, Facebook will suggest other groups to you. And so Facebook will radicalize you. If, it's, if you join bad groups, Facebook will show you even more bad groups. So bad Facebook, bad. Did you have anything to add to that? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. It's that's it's been radicalizing folks. Um, but they do. It does. It can give uh, posts more reach, but also depending if it's a private group, sometimes they'll share it outside the page and then it can like it, it depends on if it's been private, a private group or not. I think it can misbehave in that way. But generally speaking, group content is very important and Facebook prioritizes it. And Susan asks, are hashtags still useful on Twitter? And I would say yes. 
especially during tweet storms where people uh, are uh, really congregating on a hashtag um, and trending topics. But yes, yes for tags on Twitter. And on TikTok. They're very important on both. Sinead says, I tested it first. So she's talking about when you said I, I tested it. And she says, how did you go about testing it? Back so I then, uh, I had Upworthy's testing system, which was basically, um, it would show recommended articles as you were reading the article you were reading. And based on the number of people who would click after seeing reading an article, we could figure out the clicks and shares. Um, now, like, I know there's a uh, different companies that do testing services for people, um, but I don't remember which one's off the top of my head. And Facebook now has its internal testing system as well, doesn't it? Yes. Um, uh, I have gotten notice on various Facebook pages that they offer testing, and I just have been too busy to figure that out. But you should. <laughs> uh, and Rain's question is, how can we use videos for fundraising without pushing new people away and build credibility? Um, See, I kind of feel like videos sort of counteract fundraising. So I can understand why people uh, put videos on Act Blue pages and so on. But I think sometimes it splits focus. I, I wouldn't all, all necessarily go the video route, especially how much time and attention it takes to make a video. Is that really the best way? But Adam. Your thoughts? Um, I mean, I haven't been in that space for a little bit, but I would say like the only way a fundraising video works is if it's in a compelling story. Like all the ones I did, like that climate change one I talked about with municipal power, they told the story of like the heroes and the villains and the Goliath and David and like how, and then how they were going to fix it. And like, after they told you the whole story, then they asked you to contribute if you really want to. But it, you can't just put out a video that just to generally fundraise unless you tell a story with it. Um, and, you know, most of the time it, it, you know, it can read sort of like a too agenda driven. But like if, if you tell a story well and get people to keep coming back to you and build that up that trust, then they, you know, it, it could work. But again, it, it's totally dependent on how well, how well a story is told to get them there. And that leads into our next question from Jeanette that said, she asks, any advice for getting human stories? Our volunteers refuse to tell us what they're doing. Um, so one thing you can do is make it easy for people that want to share their story to share it. So for example, you could post on Facebook, you could post a tweet calling for stories, calling for specific stories because you just say, hey, do you have a story? People are like, eh, do I? But if you say, Hey, uh, if if you uh, need uh, if you need uh, Build Back Better to lower drug prices, you know how does this affect you? So if you're if you're more specific in calling out what you're looking for, um, if you post it on social media where people can see it, that sort of gives them an opportunity to self-select and raise their hand. So Be a Hero in particular has had a lot of success with getting storytellers through just asking on social media, and then the people that want to do it will speak up. And I, I would also say, like, there's, it depends on, like, what the ask is, right? So, like, uh, way back in the day, I did a project where we were trying to uh, sort of, like, build an archive of videos of the gay uh, LGBTQ experience and made a general call for, like, what's it like to be, you know, just, just general, what's it like or whatever. And at the same time, It Gets Better came out um, and started making an ask and theirs was so emotional and specific and ours was so vague in general, nothing happened with ours and it gets better really just exploded into this amazing, beautiful experience where people were able to tell, you know, the young people in their lives that they had like, actually it can get better and it'll get better for you. So having a compelling question and just keeping it simple to that one thing, uh, also can help with getting those stories. The other thing is you can look, uh, out there for stories that already exist and people who've been in the news and all these places and either do a, set up an interview with them or build a video around their story. Just make sure if it's like, if you're doing something that, you know, that could affect them, that you're connecting with them first and getting their consent. Um, and, you know, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just a question of that, you know, that's how you can go about it. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that Be A Hero has done is reached out to people that are featured in, in uh, newspaper stories because they've already spoken out and are, are public about what they're going through. 
Lauren asks, what if you're trying to debunk pervasive myths like uh, opioid pain meds are bad? Um, uh, so I believe there is a debunking misinformation panel later at Netroots, but that isn't necessarily what, what you're talking about. You're just talking about um, uh, bad ideas, but not really necessarily misinformation. Um, well, I know one thing you should never do is repeat a, a frame that's false. So I am not a crook. It's terrible because that's putting that's immediately putting into people's minds. You're a crook. So, so, so I wouldn't start off with opioid, uh, opioid pain meds are not bad or whatever. Like don't immediately throw out the thing you're trying to debunk. But uh, you probably start with the idea that you're trying to put out there. You know, opioid pain meds are most effective pain med medication for and necessary for certain chronically ill people. And then um, you just try to be as loud as possible with that message. And maybe even if, if you're responding to articles in the media or so on that are getting it wrong, uh, trying to write a letter to the editor or an opinion piece to the same paper that, that you know sets the story it sets the record straight um, yeah there, there's there's um there's a lot of art of people out there who are real experts on the framing of that stuff but the, yeah the, it's like sandwiching the the false between the first the truth and the false thing and then repeating the truth is like what i think people said is the most successful yeah, the truth sandwich thing, uh, which I have heard about, but I'm certainly not an expert in. Uh, next question is from Matthew. What do you think is the best number of times to post on different platforms per day? And it feels like that number is constantly changing and it's different per platform. So it's not like there is one prescriptive thing that will be true forever. But I personally try to go at least once daily on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram I've read can be a little bit less frequent than that. Um, and, but and Facebook cares most about regularity more than Twitter does, at least in, in, from what I've seen. Yeah. So that's as far as I know, there's also like the social scheduling platforms like Hootsuite and uh, Sprout Social that can also have like, built into their engine we make recommendations for what's best for your page because every page could be different but generally speaking like you know when to schedule and how many it can those things can pretty much tell you consistently how, how much to do um let's see alan has a comment uh he likes a hashtag at the end of campaign posts so that he can quickly click and view uh, all of them so yes uh, hashtags can be useful for reporting purposes or to see how how much something spreads even if it isn't necessarily reaching a uh new audience uh betsy comments i used to think the golden length for social media videos but i feel tiktok has shortened it to 15 seconds or less so Adam, do you think TikTok is shrinking our attention spans? No, they, um, they're, they're beta testing three minute videos now. A video is, uh, length is, uh, needs to be as long as it's needed to tell the story well. Um, there, I've seen my biggest, or one of our biggest hits ever was like a 19 minute documentary on YouTube. Our like, second biggest hit was a 37 second PSA. Um, it's, it's literally just a matter of, it, are you holding people's attention for the, the length of time that you want to? Um, if you can keep hooking them and keep them there, you, you know, you can go as long as you need. Don't do it on purpose. Like keep it as short as efficient as possible, but just, just if you're telling a compelling story, give it the time it needs to get people to stay and be hooked. Carla asks, what content is performing best on Instagram on the feed and in stories? I have no idea. I haven't <laughs> had an Instagram. Yeah, I'm not so much of an Instagram person, too, but I have seen on the posts that I do, um, memes seem to be doing really well. Uh, you see a lot of people repurposing uh, popular tweets and then framing them as, as square uh, images and putting them on Facebook and Insta, and they seem to do well. Um, 
real people. But I, I think, again, Instagram, it really depends on what your audience looks like. So if you have a personal account, your friends and family want to see you and your pets. If it's uh, a, an organization, people, people probably have different expectations. And feel free, folks, to put in your own thoughts and ideas into the chat, because I know that we have many, many experts that are a part of this. Uh, Matthew asks, how long should tweets slash Facebook posts be if they don't have video? Uh, well, I mean, there's character limits on Twitter. Um, uh, for Facebook posts, Adam, do you like long ones or short ones? It depends on what it is. Like, I mean, like one of the most interesting things about Facebook engagement is if you write a post that's too long, it makes you click to read more which counts as an engagement and makes people more invested in reading it is my theory. I don't have data behind it, but it always worked for me. Um, and again, the, the, I, I would go back to my main thing, which is tell the story well. If the post requires you to write longer, then write longer. You know, if you look at the, um, what's the Spice guy, um, Penzi Spice, their Facebook page would get insane interactions and he'd just do these long ass rants. So like, if you're telling, if you're making things that people want to share, that's all that matters. Length is less relevant. Mm -hmm. um, but I personally, when I'm um, uh, taking a post and I'm doing a Facebook ad on it, I try to make sure that uh, the most, the gist of what I'm trying to say is not hidden behind more because I, the more link, because I do want people to get what the point is, even if they don't click on more. Uh, Noel asks, how do you recruit people to your org's private Facebook group? Um, oh, you go for it. Um, I think that's something you could do via email. There used to be tools like Attentively that would match your email list to social media platforms and you'd know who was a Facebook user, but I don't think that that is still a thing anymore. So it's a little trickier. Um, but a private Facebook group seems like, first of all, something that you could advertise um, showcase not not paid advertise it's something that you could mention on your social media platforms like please join us in this group um those are the ideas that come to mind if if you're consistently interacting in the comments of your facebook page too and you see that certain users are really adding value because you don't want cr crappy people in there like you could message them as your page and be like hey we're going to start this facebook page we'd love you to be one of the first people to join it and it makes them feel more empowered as well as another way i could go Mm -hmm. Gavin asks, well, he says, this has been great because we're awesome. Thank you. Uh, what was the name of that toolkit support program? So I think maybe he's talking about, I mentioned that there are various um, software options to make social media toolkits. And one that I have worked with is called Speechify, which is speech, like S-P-E-E-C-H-I-F-A-I dot tech. Um, but there's also the social toolkit, I think is another one. So there, there are various tools. And then people also will just throw things into a Google Doc and share that. That's the really lo-fi. Um, Allie says, Swayable does creative testing for folks. Happy to connect and talk to anyone interested. So yes, if you're interested in testing your social content and you have a budget, you should talk to Swayable. Uh, Patricia says, Facebook mentioned deprioritizing political content. Does that include keywords like politicians, elected officials in posts or not really? Notice my content calling out elected officials hasn't performed that great and wondering if it's keywords or other strategies. They're lying. <laughs> it's not, they're not deprioritizing it. Like half my feed now are my liberal friends commenting on right-wing radical pages. And it's like been popping up on my feed lately because they, again, don't know what they're doing. Uh, and then they just, bad things happen. Um, they say they're deprioritizing de it, but again, it's it, like, you know, the, at the end of the day, like if you're telling a good story, people will react to it, um, in my opinion. Alan says, what about production quality, pro or user generated? Which is better and when? Um, I really feel like in almost all cases, uh, lo-fi user generated stuff is going to perform better because it goes back to what Adam was saying about authenticity. Like really polished stuff doesn't feel real to people, feels like an ad and people don't like ads. And I, I think it, it's, it's subjective, but like, again, it's all about the story. If you're telling an amazing story with high production value, it can, it'll do well. If you have an amazing story with a raw camera feed, that also will crush it. So like, just depending on your budget and your priorities and what will make 
do the story the best service, I think, is what will really count. Nikki says, what about sharing links on Facebook? I've heard it is better to post links in comments as opposed to the original post because Facebook deprioritizes posts with links that takes users away from Facebook. Lots. Um, Facebook deprioritizes video. I know that they don't like YouTube and it's better to post video direct to Facebook, but I don't know that they deprioritize links. What do you think, Adam? Their content will always come for highest, but then... Yeah, if, if the link is something that other people are also reacting to and it's getting a lot of, of reach, um, you know, there's the, the Twitter account, top 10 Facebook posts, a uh, video, uh, top 10 Facebook posts that shows the horrifying like reach of all these right wing pages because they're always at the top because Facebook is prioritizing their stuff and it's clearly links to their stories on their pages. So I think uh, link to posts as long as they're really engaging. And we are at time, but I think we pretty much got through everybody's questions. Um, we may have missed one or two. Um, the last question I will answer is uh, Amanda asks, uh, any advice on how to share or make a press release more engaging on social media? Um, so what I have done is I will pull the quote from the press release and put that in a pretty graphic you know, and a good quote, not like a, this is really bad, or, you know, we should do better, but you know, like a, a good quote, strong quote, uh, put that into a graphic and then uh, share the graphic and, you know, also, you know, include a link with it, especially on Facebook or Twitter, you know, read more and then the link, but pick out the most compelling piece and share it that way. And it will do more than just a dry press release. And if your boss says you have to tell them if they want to make the Facebook page worse, you can do that. But it would probably would be better for them to come up with a better way to share what they want to talk about. Yes. And there probably are sessions at Netroots on how to manage upward and deal with bosses. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we will make the slides available one way or another. Um, maybe through the app, maybe another way. Follow us on social media anyway and uh, stay in touch. Thanks, everyone.